truth be heard. Amen. Beloved, fall is upon us, and while you might not be able to tell by the weather, you can certainly tell by the arrival of stewardship materials. Yes, it's fundraising time in the church universal. Baptists do it. Quakers do it. Pinched face Calvinists do it. Even money talk avoiding Episcopalians do it. Stewardship, church speak for fundraising, ought to have its own liturgical color for the weeks in October. Maybe red for the wrong color of ink in the ledger. Or red for a plea to the Holy Spirit to move people's hands to add extra zeros on their pledges. Stewardship time is the least favorite season on the church calendar. Its weeks produced angst for the finance committee. Will enough money be raised to cover our expenses? Angst for the staff. Will their salaries be covered? Angst for the vestry. How will we make decisions about what to cut should the need arise? Angst for the clergy. How will we effectively comfort and challenge, challenge and comfort, angst for the members, how will we give what is wanted when we don't feel we have enough, angst for the visitors, good Lord, we came here just to hear about Jesus. All this angst, all this angst is legitimate, but because Church budgets in the 21st century are a big nut to cover because, because church members and church visitors want a lot of services to be provided, provided on demand, so to speak, provided without a demand of volunteer hours, and of course, outsourced services come with a financial cost. So, to relieve or at least reduce the angst, a stewardship industry has emerged. Fundraising for churches, akin to fundraising for nonprofits. And the key seems to be an effective campaign with colorful posters of satisfied givers and a snappy theme and scripted testimonials and a giveaway, a giveaway, and stories about what's being done in the organization and explicitly answering these four questions. Does the organization do good work? Is the organization well managed? Will my gift make a difference? Will the experience be satisfying to me? If the answer is yes to all four questions, then you have run an effective campaign and can expect a successful return. But the thought occurs, the church is not a nonprofit organization. The church is not a charitable institution. The church aligns with both of those qualities, but the church has a different mission. The church is about the business of building up the kingdom of God. The church exists to make God's will manifest on earth as it is in heaven. And if that is our singular purpose, to help bring God's plan to fruition on earth, 
then maybe we need God's advice on how to fund that work. And not surprising, God has some thoughts on the topic. God has a very specific funding strategy, which he has articulated clearly in multiple places over multiple generations. His strategy is called the tithe. From Genesis, through the prophets, through the gospels, through the Acts of the Apostles, through the epistles to the early churches, God commands, God commends the tithe. God says, my faithful people, my faithful people will render the tithe for the building up of my kingdom. And here's what we know about God's command to tithe. It has four parts. First, what is the tithe? And today there is some confusion, and the words giving and pledging and tithing are often used as synonyms, and they are not the same. Giving is what we do when we visit a church. When we go to a precious little baptism and the plate comes down the pew, we reach in our pockets and put something in. When we go to our nephew's confirmation and the plate comes down, we reach in our pockets and put something in. When we go to a classmate's ordination, we put something in for their discretionary fund. When we go to our mother's church on Mother's Day, the plate comes down, we put something in. We don't plan for it. We don't budget for it. It's kind of like a tip. Pledging. Pledging is a thoughtful determination. We look over the items in our household budget and we add what we're going to give to the church. And it typically falls under the mortgage and under the credit card bills, but above pizza night. Pledging. Tithing. Tithing is 10% of our household income. 10% of our household income. The first fruits. The first item on the family's budget. Before shelter, before food, before clothing, before personal savings, before college fund, before retirement, before Disney World vacation before shin guards, before piano lessons, before replacing the car. 10% right off the top is returned back to God. That's what tithing is. That's what God commands and commends. It's not giving. It's not pledging. But it's a really easy calculation. This is our annual household income, and 10% of that figure goes to explicitly building up the kingdom of God. Part one of understanding God's directive to tithe is to understand that tithe is 10% of what God has originated in our 100% earnings. Part two is to understand what is meant by the building up of God's kingdom. How do we return the first fruits of our compensated endeavors to the Lord? What is the mechanism, and what does he consider appropriate use? Jesus was very clear when asked, how are we to pray? He said, pray this. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Take your heart, take your energy, take your intellect, take your resources, and co-create with me the dream I have for life on earth as I have already ordered it in heaven. This means use your first fruits. Use your tithe to help live out the great commandment and the great commission in the world. 
Use the time to fund your work and your rest in loving God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Use your tithes to fund your work and your rest in loving your neighbors, your brother and your sister across God's creation as you love yourself. Use your tithes to fund your work and your rest in carrying the good news, the redemptive work of Jesus out into the world, to those dark places in the world, those places crying out for hope and compassion. In these activities, you will enact my dream for life on earth as it unfolds in heaven. The mission of the church is to do one of those things. We provide a place and a time and an intentional focus on worshiping. Here we provide opportunities to care for our neighbors, those known well within the body, and for those whose needs we are called to discover and to answer. We offer instructions on the ethos and ethics of Jesus Christ, Son of God. Here we prepare disciples. Here we prepare people to grow deeper in their love and knowledge of the Lord, and here we prepare people to carry those qualities into the world to be lights, to be points of light and grace for others. And therefore, the church seems a worthy, legitimate repository of one's tithe. The third part of the tithe is that it is to be a sign of gratitude. God created us with an inner yearning to respond to the universe with thanksgiving and appreciation. God made us with a desire to approach the world from a place of gratefulness. Because when we see and seize life with wonder and gratitude rather than entitlement, we are rewarded with openness and optimism. When we tithe, we activate the grace dynamic. You've read this recently. Returning to God our first fruits, our first 10%, signifies a sufficient generosity, which begets grace, which begets gratitude, which begets generosity, which begets grace, which begets gratitude, and so the cycle continues. Those who tithe find real peace sense of well-being in God's care. Those who tithe are remarkably, remarkably less anxious about their finances and their security in the world. Think on this. Think on this. It is so counterintuitive. But those who tithe are remarkably, remarkably less anxious about their finances and their security in the world. This is part of God's plan. This is why he commands and commends the tithe. The tithe is a gift to us, not a burden placed upon us. The final part of the tithe is the crux and the sticking point. God says, Beloved, beloved, Give me a tenth back of the whole I have given you in your life, the whole I have given you in your life, because, because it will be hard for you at first. It will be hard for you, but through it you will discover faith rewarded. It will be such a gift to you. When you tithe, you will see me bless you in ways you cannot yet imagine. you that you're going to find a pot of gold in your basement. I'm not telling you you're going to find a lottery ticket on your windshield. I'm telling you a way will be made, a way will be made, and you won't worry, and you won't miss that 10% you give. This stepping out in faith will be good for you. God promises But we aren't convinced. We aren't convinced. 
And I know we aren't convinced because I see it right now. We aren't convinced. In fact, we want the opposite dynamic. We want God to step out first. We want God to step out at first, and when we see it safe, we'll follow. But of course, of course, God has always stepped out first, and we too often forget. We want another and another and another and another sign. This morning's gospel shows us this dynamic clearly. The disciples cry out to Jesus, Increase our faith! Lord, make us certain! Lord, erase all our fear! Lord, make us so sure there really is no decision! Take all the faithful responsibility off us. Lord, you go first yet again. Increase our faith. And Jesus replies, if he had just a little, if he just had a tiny mote, a mustard seed worth, you would be so powerfully blessed. For heaven's sake, for heaven's sake, trust God. Trust God to live up to his promises. Trust God and be transformed. The tithe is a gift, not a burden from God. The tithe is a singular way to say, God, this is scary. I'm not sure how this is going to work out for me and my family. But you say do this thing, so I will. The tithe is a gift because God will see your faith and God will bless your effort. And in that blessing, your faith will be justified. And in your faith being justified, it will increase. And increased faith leads to increased serenity. So that's the explication of the tithe. God commands it, and it seems as if it's in our best interest to follow God's command. The tithe is used for the building up of the kingdom of God on earth, and as we inhabit the earth, it seems to be in our best interest to fund that building. The tithe engenders gratitude, and psychologists tell us that humans, humans thrive on gratitude. They face challenges so much easier when they are imbued with gratitude. The tithe engenders faith, and faith is also so very good for us. So, beloved, it would seem on paper that the tithe is a really, really good investment. But how about a practical example? A real-life, lived-out example. I really felt that was sufficient. And one Sunday I was in a pew, and a priest talked about tithing. Well, I don't do that. I don't do that. And I probably ought to. And it was at a really, really, really hard time in my life. Um, I was going to have to support myself and two children, and I had no idea how. cover that whole nut. I certainly didn't know how I was going to be able to do that with 90% of what I had coming in. But I thought, I ought to think about this. And I thought about it, and it scared me silly. And so I said, God, I can't do that. I'm not that faithful. And so with the pledge card, I wrote down 5% was ridiculous. 
was ridiculous for me to write that figure. And then I added $10 just as a show of good faith. So 5% plus 10. And I turned it in, and I was so anxious. I was anxious about the mortgage. I was anxious about the credit card. I was anxious about the shin guards. I was anxious about everything. And at the end of the year, we were okay. I can't. We were okay. Makes no sense. We were okay. We had everything we needed covered. We had everything we wanted that was good for us covered. We were okay. So the pledge card came out for that year, and I put 7%. Things just happened. We were okay. And the next year came, and I filled in 10%, and we were okay. So for 25 years now, for 25 years, I've tithed in good times and lean times and leaner times and good times, and me and mine have always been okay. I mean, the thought occurred... There's never a good time to tithe. Little kids, retirement, anything in between, there's never a good time to tithe, but God says there is no bad time to tithe. So, I took him at his word. And now, I want you to listen closely. I'm going to ask the members of this body who have tithed for the last three years to stand up. There are no assumptions being made about people still sitting. It may well be you've tithed for the last two and a half years. There are no assumptions made about the people standing that they are perfected or that they are more pious or perfect in their faith. What's being said here is these people are people who have heard God's command and said, I think I will step out in faith and maybe I'll be okay. And in fact, they are okay. Trisha, stand up again. I want you to see these folks so that you can see that they pay their mortgage and they go on vacation and they have money to buy new shoes and they're okay. And you can ask them about that. You really can. You can ask them how that experience has been for them and how their faith has been rewarded. You can ask them because it's a really easy conversation. You can ask me. You don't have to be scared about that. They're at peace. And they have peace of mind because God makes it so. And in a few minutes, we'll collect our pledges for the next year. And if, if in fact, the Holy Spirit is nudging you this morning and you want to pray, and converse about this next week, take your card home and bring it back next week and we'll have another in-gathering and we'll bless those cards as well. We'll bless them, but we won't sermonize over them. So, beloved, to this intention and for all God's gifts and benefits to us, we say, Amen.